uh, be hosting Undersecretary Sarah Sewell um, for an address on combating human trafficking in 2015. This is, as you know, uh, Human Trafficking Awareness Month, uh, so it's very fitting. And uh, Dr. Sewell, Undersecretary Sewell, has a very long career that makes her a perfect person to be in the, the job of Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. She combines Hill experience, experience in academia, work with NGOs advising, and deep, deep experience working with the uniformed services. Um, many years ago, I hosted a meeting in Europe that was on counterterrorism. And uh, Dr. Sewell worked very closely with the military on the, what we called the Bible, but it, it wasn't. It was a, a, a book on counter, a field manual, a field manual on coin. Um, so very diverse background, and an important thing to note, the mother of four uh, daughters. And uh, so while all of us were busy working on other things, she was, in addition to all these amazing things, raising four children with her, with her husband, uh, Tom Conroy, who's served uh, in a distinguished way in the um, state of Massachusetts. So on your seats, you had cards. Um, I would encourage you as you listen to Undersecretary Sewell, if you have questions that you want asked, write legibly and please pass them back to Sada. Raise your hand, Sada. Sada Mohammed, who we thank very much for helping us organize. Um, and she's going to take a quick cut and then they're going to make their way to me um, and we'll have a Q&A session that way um, after remarks. So without further ado, please help me welcome your Secretary Sewell. Thank you, Nadia. Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you, Sarah, dear friend, esteemed colleague, um, longtime fellow traveler, uh, for an opportunity to talk with you all this evening uh, uh, here about human trafficking. And it really makes a great deal of sense to be at CSIS to have this conversation because this organization really has been home to a multi-dimensional understanding of international security and a thought leader in that field for a long time. But it's also a real honor to be in the room with a host of, of true trafficking experts. Uh, I am not a true trafficking expert. I'm still a student of, of the slavery movement and, um, and, a, and a supporter of the work of many who have been doing this for a long, long time. And it's, it's always an honor to be with people who represent uh, the movement. And I'm going to offer a few observations as an outsider about how far you all have come and the kind of impact that you have had. Um, my thoughts, of course, are shaped by my current role, bureaucracy. Your, your stand is where you sit. So I sit at Jay, uh, which is the Undersecretariat for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. Um, but I think it, it bears uh, explaining that the, the bureaus within the Undersecretariat are quite diverse and might not um, be self-evident. So they include the Bureau of Democracy, uh, Human Rights and Labor. They, they include uh, the Population, Refugees, and Migration Office. Um, but they also include the Counterterrorism Office. They include the um, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau that does all of our, um, our rule of law and security sector reform work, as well as other bureaus. And of course, um, within the Undersecretary is the, uh, the Trafficking in Persons Office. And so I have the distinct privilege of thinking about civilian security issues from a multitude of perspectives and working on really some of the cutting edge challenges um, in civilian security. And I would, I would place um, traffic, anti-trafficking work squarely in that, in that lens. So my goal is to offer perspectives today on how far we've come, but to also talk a little bit about my own view as the next layer of the onion that we are unpeeling as we make progress in fighting human slavery. So as Sarah said, uh, President Obama uh, has declared 
January National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. But 2015 as a year is important to the movement because it marks the 15th anniversary of both our anti-trafficking legislation, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or TVPA, as it is commonly referred to, as well as the UN Protocol to Prevent, Suppress, and Punish Trafficking in Persons, which is known to most of you as the Palermo Protocol. And normatively, I think it's fair to say that we've come an astonishing way in, in 15 years. We have 166 states that are party to the Palermo Protocol. And human trafficking has moved from a misunderstood, often treated as secondary issue, to an international priority that is regularly raised by the highest officials and leaders throughout the world, including President Obama and the Pope. And practically more than 100 countries have passed special anti-trafficking laws, and many have established specialized law enforcement units. They've set up trafficking victim assistance mechanisms. They've launched public awareness campaigns aimed at combating the global crime. And yet, as you know, we have an enormous way to go before human trafficking is eradicated across the globe. So we have a great deal to be proud of, and I think Congress and the American people really can take a great deal of credit for helping move uh, this issue on the normative agenda and in terms of its practical progress. The TVPA and the annual State Department Trafficking in Persons report, the TIP report that the TVPA mandates, really has played a major role in galvanizing global awareness of human trafficking and international action to address both labor and sex trafficking crimes. The report analyzes the efforts of 188 countries and territories, including, very importantly, including the United States, to confront this global scourge. Fueled by the dedication of the team in the State Department's TIP offices, as well as officers in every US mission around the world, the TIP report plays an important role in confronting this lucrative transnational crime. Secretary Kerry called it a gold standard in assessing how well governments, including our own, are meeting their responsibility of confronting human trafficking. TVPA lays out a set of criteria by which the State Department assesses foreign government responses in human, to human trafficking. So countries and territories are ranked by tiers based on their compliance with the standards enumerated in the law. The report not only provides an annual snapshot of the problem, but it also, through its rankings and its associated regime and norm setting, helps hold governments accountable in their efforts to fight human trafficking, and it motivates governments to develop policies and structures to fight the serious crime. Researchers have documented the impact of the report on states' responses to trafficking, including the correlation between tier ranking downgrades and subsequent enactment of anti-trafficking legislation. The TIP report also provides a list of specific recommendations for how each country and territory can better prevent this crime, prosecute its perpetrators, and assist its victims. And these recommendations really are at the heart of the report. They guide US diplomacy and engagement on human trafficking issues publicly and privately. They serve as a roadmap to better address the problem, not for the sake of improving a tier ranking, but rather for making institutional changes that will put additional traffickers behind bars, will help victims get assistance, and will prevent the vulnerable from being exploited. The State Department's TIP office has increasingly sought to combine TIP diplomacy with complementary programming to help countries achieve outcomes. Example, last year, TIP office funded Free the Slaves, the International Association for Women Judges, and the Warnaf Group to help Haiti enact a strong anti-trafficking law and initiate its very first trafficking prosecution. And these efforts are especially significant given Haiti's chronically weak institutions and its ongoing political deadlock over, this, over the scheduling of overdue local and legislative elections. In Burma, three years of intensified diplomatic engagement has galvanized significant anti-trafficking reforms, including the repeal in 2012 of two British-era laws that explicitly allowed officials to subject citizenry to forced labor and the enactment of a new law prohibiting all forms of forced labor.
President Obama's historic trip to Burma in 2012 saw the forging of the first of its kind U.S.-Myanmar joint plan on trafficking in persons and the initiation of a standalone bilateral tip dialogue between our two countries. And we continue to work closely with the Burmese government to support the implementation of its laws and tangible steps to address longstanding human trafficking issues. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, USAID is supporting an assessment to measure the scope and nature of human trafficking in the artisanal mining industry in South Kivu and Katanga provinces. The results will inform the design and implementation of a new program to combat trafficking and labor exploit exploitation in Congo's mining sector. And in Nigeria, USAID is providing psychosocial counseling and healing for women and young girls abducted from Chibok in Nigeria. A train, training of the trainers program teaches local Christian and Muslim women to use their capacity and skills to help traumatized individuals from Chibok and the wider communities. One of the things that has been um, surprising to me since I came to the State Department is the extent to which, as the Under Secretariat for Civilian Security, um, almost every issue that I touch has a trafficking dimension. So whether I'm working on counterterrorism issues or whether I, I'm, I'm supporting INL and their efforts to build rule of law and hold perpetrators accountable, um, whether we're talking about the conflict and stabilization work of CSO, um, so often there are trafficking equities and issues implicated in the work that is done by bureaus that don't have trafficking <coughs> in their title. And that really speaks to me as a longstanding student of international politics and someone who believes very strongly that the quality of rights that are experienced is intrinsically linked to the security uh, that, is, that exists throughout the world. And in the J world, we concentrate on the connections between rights and security. We, 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 we see national security issues as being um, inclusive of rights issues. And, and the fact that we have the Counterterrorism Bureau and the Bureau for Human Rights under the same undersecretariat speaks to the, the integration that was envisioned when the J undersecretariat was first formed. What that means for the trafficking office, I think, is a future ahead of, of ever greater coordination and integration with the broader work of state. Now, we work a lot on crises in the under, J Undersecretariat. We work a lot on state failure. And for those of you who have been following trafficking for a long time, it will not surprise you to know that these are among the most critical indicators of trafficking problems. Um, crises often cause a spike in trafficking because people are displaced, they lose income sources, and they seek security for themselves and their families, often in unfamiliar contexts. And the breakdown of societal and governmental structures leave po leaves populations vulnerable as protections are reduced and options for recourse disappear. So while human trafficking is a problem in every country, including our own, we've seen how traffickers take advantage of conflict the collapse of state institutions, allied criminal networks, and even natural disasters to prey on and exploit vulnerable civilians. Pope Francis was highlighting this connection in his recent World Day of Peace message. As he said, further causes of slavery include armed conflicts, violence, criminal activity, and terrorism. Many people are kidnapped in order to be sold, enlisted as combatants, or sexually exploited while others are forced to emigrate, leaving everything behind, their country, home, property, and even members of their family. Now, terrorism's nexus to trafficking is not new. The so-called language schools that sex traffickers used as visa mills were the very institutes that provided visa paperwork to the 9-11 hijackers. But the connection between terrorism and trafficking has really been brought to the fore by ISIL and Boko Haram. And these hideous groups have proudly professed practicing slavery, justifying their actions with a perverse interpretation of Islam. And in early December, ISIL even published a list of rules on how female slaves, both adults and children, should be treated one ca once captured. And the pamphlet instructs that it's permissible to have sexual intercourse with, 
to beat and to trade non-Muslim slaves, including young girls. In my meetings with Yazidi leaders, I've seen firsthand the psychologically devastating effect of knowledge that a close relative is being enslaved. I cannot imagine, but I know that you know the pain of those who have been victims of trafficking. Fortunately, when governments are prepared and when they're strong enough to confront traffickers, vulnerabilities can be reduced even in crises. The 2013 super typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines left large segments of the population vulnerable to traffickers. The Philippine government's previous investments in addressing human trafficking enabled it to react quickly. It immediately cooperated closely with international and local NGOs to provide security and screening checkpoints at evacuation centers, in tent cities, and at major transportation hubs. These preventive measures helped protect vulnerable populations as they migrated en masse to other parts of the country and resettled in temporary shelters or private residences. Ongoing activities to raise awareness and prevent human trafficking among those communities continues through tip office funding to the International Organization for Migration. And in the fight against human trafficking, I do see enormous value in looking at the challenge from a more holistic foreign policy perspective. In the J. Under Secretariat, we look at foreign policy through the lens of people, not simply through the lens of states. And we see through that lens international stability and state weakness as coming into focus as the next phase of the struggle against human slavery. The reality is that we need peace and we need effective states to win the fight against slavery. And this, in fact, is the State Department and USAID's core work. The US government works diligently to prevent and stabilize conflicts and where it cannot to help refugees and the internally displaced. And these activities are not always recognized as, a, as part of a comprehensive approach to fight human trafficking. But without them, the more tailored interventions that we undertake will not be sustainable. And so it behooves us to understand the broader context of state effectiveness and stability in which anti-trafficking efforts are most successful. In Jordan, USAID integrated counter-trafficking activities into broader human rights program that combats sexual and gender-based violence, early marriage, and child labor among Syrian refugees and host communities affected by the crisis in Syria. And with State Department funding, the International Center for Migration Policy Development is assessing the impact of the Syrian war on trafficking in persons in Lebanon and the surrounding region. This information then helps us inform our humanitarian assistance at a time in which, according to UNHCR, more people were forcibly displaced as refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people than at any time since World War II. But even where states are not directly challenged by the implications of conflict, they may still be fragile, they may still be corrupt, they may be simply poor and weak. None of our normative progress matters if states can't enforce the laws that they've passed. And so the questions of state capacity and sufficient stability to provide a rule of law framework is really central to the anti-trafficking cause. And where the US foreign partners and civil society can address that state weakness, we can provide a more stable and effective platform for protecting citizens. Poor enforcement of labor laws, discrimination, restrictions on freedom of association, and other human rights and labor rights violations um, place, leave many workers at risk of exploitation, including trafficking. And here's where the rest of RJA enterprise comes in. So the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor promotes internationally recognized labor rights, including for migrant workers, as part of its core mandate. The Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs has some of the department's strongest tools for strengthening rule of law and helping governments prevent and combat corruption. Its anti-corruption and law enforcement programming provides training to law enforcement officers and the judiciary on investigating human trafficking and corruption cases. The INL also works on border issues. So does the Counterterrorism Bureau. 
border control is a state function that's critical for anti-trafficking work. And some of the counter-terrorist work that is done to promote rule of law responses to terrorism can also, as we've seen in the context of the connection between trafficking with ISIL and Boko Haram, be used to combat trafficking. Interagency training at US missions overseas, including Brazil, Cambodia, Philippines, Togo, Hong Kong, has enabled State Department, DHS, and FBI agents to pursue domestic trafficking cases through international cooperation and engagement in foreign countries. And our agencies have trained more than 1,700 law enforcement and consular offices, officers, as well as locally trained staff at overseas posts. And finally, I would just say that since the crimes of enslavement and sexual slavery may in certain circumstances constitute crimes against humanity or war crimes, the Office of Global Criminal Justice works to deter those crimes and ongoing conflicts across the globe by promoting documentation, advocating early implementation of judicial mechanisms, and once the tribunal's been established, working with those bodies to make sure that those who commit atrocity crimes are brought to justice. And that's just the J Undersecretariat within the State Department. And USAID's work and the work of other government agencies is also broader. So there is there is a, a huge and comprehensive line of effort that is dedicated to controlling conflict and increasing state capacity and increasing accountability of states for state capacity that very much provide the platform in which the anti-trafficking interventions that we, you, have been working on so successfully um, for many years can take root and become institutionalized. And over the last 15 years, it's the United States and our partners that have led efforts to end this crime. And we'll continue to do so. Um, our work's cut out for us. Respect for human rights, domestic and international rule of law, strong democratic institutions and partnerships with civil society are keys not only to preventing political crises, but also to enabling the state to act quickly and efficiently when they occur. My recent trip to India, I had the opportunity to meet with Kailash Satyarthi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, who has dedicated his life to ending child labor and working with young victims of trafficking. And in his acceptance speak in Oslo, he said, I refuse to accept that all the temples and mosques and churches and prayer houses have no place for the dreams of our children. I refuse to accept that the world is so poor when just one week of global military expenditure can bring all our children into classrooms. I refuse to accept that all the laws and constitutions and judges and police are not able to protect our children. And I refuse to accept that the shackles of slavery can ever be stronger than the quest for freedom. I refuse to accept. And Americans and their government also refuse to accept. And it's not simply a question of decency, but it is also a matter of self-interest. Because in working for justice, we will not only begin to eradicate human trafficking, but we will make the world a safer and ultimately more prosperous and stable place. So thank you, and I look forward to discussion. With you. Great, that was wonderful. I hope people have questions and you're writing them down and passing them back. While you do that, I'm going to ask a few questions. Um, I think the first place that I wanted to start was back to this question of a more holistic foreign policy perspective. Um, it, is, it is wonderful, all the tools that, that Jay has. Um, but a lot of activity at state and in the field is with the regional bureaus. And it, sometimes it occurs where the regional bureaus they see the trafficking report is coming up. They're like, oh, God, that means reporting requirements. And what's, the, what's your sense of the ability to get at a variety of levels, assistant secretary, uh, deputy assistant secretary, engagement outside the Jay family? Because ultimately, and I think Secretary Kerry has been quite compelling on this, um, that's where a lot of the, the rubber meets the road, so to speak. No, it's a great question, Sarah. And Secretary Kerry believes very strongly that we need to mainstream this issue into our, our diplomatic dialogue across the board. And in some places, it's a more obvious and natural issue of engagement than others. But I think, um, I think that the, the Trafficking in Persons report 
provides a mechanism that we can use internally to facilitate that conversation as well as a way to sort of structure a dialogue with uh, foreign countries that are subjects of the report. In other words, um, we've made a, an effort this year, and I think we'll see an even more methodical effort next year to do sort of a mid-year check-in with the regional bureaus on those countries that have uh, particularly challenging uh, circumstances that face them, and that can come in a variety of different forms, and then use that as an opportunity to work with both the regional bureau and with POST to engage the country and seeing what are the interventions that can be made at this point in time so that we have less of a gap between sort of report to report without engagement. And everyone is very busy, um, but I think you know, when, when the report comes out, it consumes an enormous amount of time. And the ideal, as the Secretary has made it clear to us, is that we use the, the data that is collected by the TIP report as a mechanism for helping tip problems go away. That's the goal. And so we will be working um, concertedly within the bureaucracy using um, the framework provided by the TVPA uh, to, to better engage on a more ongoing basis. That's great to hear. I think um, generally the community is very interested in making sure that survivor voices are, are very clearly uh, heard and a part of the, the programming. But you know we're in this new era where new donors are popping up, uh, private sector has a role to play, and I think a lot of us are hoping that um, the embassy of the 21st century is engaging a variety of different um, new potential partners uh, on the ground. And I know having you as a champion, and that's going to be very helpful. Um, the U.S. government uh, is one of the most responsive donors um, as a whole. Um, I think the number generally is about 60 million. Um, but the amount of money that is generated from trafficking is, I mean, the numbers vary between 150 million, 30 million, a lot of money, um, to billions, uh, hundreds of billions. So clearly we can't do this by ourselves. Your message about this being a security issue, um, both it being a security issue but its connections to corruption are, I think, a very important calling card in mm -hmm. talking to some bilateral agencies but also private philanthropy. Unfortunately, I hear too often, you know, we're a, we're a nonprofit, so we are uh, very reliant on support from um, donors, uh, individuals, companies, governments. And a lot of times people say, well, we just we don't work on combating slavery. And you sort of want to say, well, what does that mean? Are you for it? Of course not. So um, on your travels, uh, what, what would you think about uh, you come back next year and you can tell us uh, what the response has been and, and the bilateral uh, governments that you meet and, and their willingness? Well, it's really interesting. What, uh, a, a general friend of mine likes to say, you know, Sarah, all crime runs on the same rails. And uh, I think the military has cottoned on to the fact, because partly because they use the networks model as a way of doing threat assessment, um, that many of the networks overlap. And so crimes come in various forms. And what you know, INL may be tracking as a, a, a drug trafficking network, TIP may be tracking as a trafficking in persons network. Um, but the the potential for overlap and for sort of nefarious partnership is enormous. And I think as we look at the spread of terror networks, particularly I mean, most recently just looking at the, the spread across um, sort of the Maghreb and the Sahel, you know, you can, you can almost trace the networks and you can see that the movement in people and the movement in arms and the movement in drugs and the movement in, it, it, it is extraordinary. These, these are, are interwoven threats that feed off one another. And, um, particularly as we move into an era of sort of governing terrorism where terrorist actors need to finance their activities because they're holding territory and supposedly providing services, although we have no reason to believe that that's the real interest. Um, the, the issues of trafficking and the issues of, of criminal activity to support them will become more apparent, I think. So as I look at 
20, the 21st century security environment, I just increasingly see the rights issues interwoven front and center with those challenges. And so I think um, both, gov domestic, both the governments with whom we, we speak, but also the way we frame as a government the security challenges really needs to be inclusive. And that's what we see as a, a central preoccupation of Jay is to help point that out. Uh, at CSIS in, uh, gosh, now 10 years ago, we were working very hard. Um, Martina Vandenberg, who's in the audience, uh, and others, um, the Norwegian mission at NATO, the US mission at NATO, to get a policy at NATO on combating trafficking, um, and at DOD, and at the UN. And I have to say, there was, at that time, a lot of um, segmentation. People would sure. say, uh, well, we work on trafficking in arms and, and uh, narcotics, but not on people. So to the extent that you can really push that message and make sure that certainly all the parts of your bureau understand that kind of, well, that's them and not us, is just not very good 21st century response to these networks, because they're coordinating. Um, it's puzzling to a lot of us, there's the numbers of um, trafficked victims around the world vary enormously. Mm -hmm. um, some organizations are talking about 21 million, some others are talking about 36 million. And even though we've had a lot of progress in 15 years, I think we're still at a point, and I'm thrilled to see everybody in this room here tonight, I do feel we're still at a point where we're fighting to go from the margins to the mainstream. And I worry a little bit that having such wildly divergent numbers undermines us. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit, and then I'm going to ask Sada to bring some of the questions up, to this issue of data. Um, it is, I mean, you can have a longer conversation about the degree to which human rights in general has been saturated or not with data. But here is a case where it really is quite critical. Now, there's some people saying, be careful, bad data is not going to help us. Um, we have certainly been interested in public opinion surveys being a generator of um, population-based estimates on whether or not, um, for example, we did a survey in Russia a number of years ago, and it turned out, based on the sample, that there were something like 90,000 to 150,000 females living in Russia ages roughly at that time, 18 to 32, who had been trafficked at some point mm. in their lives. No services whatsoever supporting them. So those, you know, data can be a very persuasive, or certainly public opinion data. Um, any, uh, I think I'm putting in a pitch to uh, support those around the world who are trying to figure out, is it 21, 36, where is it? Um, any comment? Sure. Well, I was looking to see sort of how much, how, ma how many discrepant numbers I might have in the materials with me. But I think um, it's fair to say that the the U.S. government's view is that we'll use the ILO figures. Yeah. And that's that's how we yep. approach it. But I, I would draw on my own background in in trying to um, promote the accounting for civilian casualties. My my pre-government experience, and there you also saw in an emerging field that was very methodologically challenging to document. Mm -hmm. Norm, you know, enormous divergence in, in estimates and very diverse methodologies that were used to uh, achieve them. And I think that is, um, that is natural in an emerging field. And I think it's natural when the problem is huge. Yeah. Um, and often, you know, you're relying, I mean, I, Holly Burkhalter was just talking to me about um, a survey that, that her organization was doing to try to document very clearly um, a particular element of labor rights violations. And you know, the, the amount of work that goes into something that is methodologically as pure as we would like you know, our NIH proposals to be it is significant, but it's doable. Whether it's doable on a scale that's going to really get us to a number that we're comfortable with um, isn't clear. I think w from a policy perspective, um, we know enough to know that it's a huge problem. We know enough to know that it's a pervasive problem. We know enough to know that everyone needs to be part of the solution. And so the beauty of the Trafficking in Persons Report, in my view, is that it paints that mosaic about the, the character of the harms, 
And, and so regardless of the quantification of mm -hmm. the harms, you, you, are, you are pointed toward the kinds of interventions and solutions that are required. And so part of the answer to your question about you know, how, how much does, how do we move there depends right. on, well, what, why is it that you want to know that? Right. And so um, you know, on the civilian casualty side, we were always asking ourselves, does it really help us if we know it was you know, 3,000 versus 5,000? We know we want to address the causes. And so I think there, there are ways to both put in perspective the historical quest for you know, quantitative certainty on really tough problems, but I think there's also, you know, it shouldn't be a deterrent to the fact that you know, we know there's a problem and we know that there are always going to be different dimensions of the solutions for us to work on. Right. We have a lot of really great questions. I apologize in advance if I don't get to all of them. Um, and they're remarkably legible. Clear. Yes, I um, went to Quaker School, and I learned many wonderful things at Quaker School, but handwriting is not one of them. Um, this question comes from somebody who's identified themselves. Um, it's a captain in the US Army in strategic intelligence. Um, Raise your hand if you want to be acknowledged. OK. Um, can you further elaborate the ways you see traditionally ideologically based terrorist organizations, Al-Qaeda, I'm going to call it ISIL, not ISIS, um, Boko Haram, using the criminal terrorist act of human trafficking? Do you see indicators of this tactic beginning to spread among other transnational terrorist organizations? Because it kind of feels like that. How can we better take a whole of government approach to this dichotomy of ideology and criminal activity? Mm -hmm. So great question. Um, and I spoke a little bit to it earlier. But, but I think to, to honor it properly, it's worth pointing out that, um, that there's a fine line between, um, in, the, in the terror context, you know, recruitment and coercion um, can coexist. And you know, Boko Haram and the most recent cases of, you know, very young suicide bombers is a is a great example of that. I mean, it's, you, know, you want to know what she knew and, and what was in her head. I think that um, we are going to see terror actors increasingly adapt their their tactics. And I think it's it's what's notable to me is if you if you try to understand the evolution of some terror actors and the way in which we are morphing toward a governing terrorist model in some cases, that's when you see the need for income generation. That's when you see the need or the desire to create sort of families and society and supporting structures. And, and you have to artificially create it because it wasn't there in many cases or it wasn't there with your people. And so the, the kinds of methods that are going to be employed for population control and for um, the appearance of governance are, um, are likely to differ from the tactics that have traditionally been employed by terror organizations. So I, I can't speak to uh, exactly how those will evolve, and I can't, I can't say that I, I see it as a trend that's definitely expanding, but I can note that, that we were not aware of it to the same extent, the trafficking angle for sure, to the same extent prior to ISIL and the lens coming clearly down on Boko Haram. And so I do think we should probably be thinking about a host of associated criminal activity that's likely to parallel as governing terrorists seek to uh, generate both uh, revenue and control, and, and that this is an area that really needs a great deal of attention because um, it, it, it does not lend itself to the typical counterterrorism mm. intervention. Right. There is a moment, uh, as we are in 2015, when the post-2015 uh, sustainable development goals are going to be negotiated. And the language that exists happily has a few elements to combat trafficking, including a focus on child soldiers. So I think that one thing we might want to keep an eye on over the next year, um, certainly as communities raise their voice on what they want to see in the post-MDGs and as the US goes into negotiation, is that a, a focus on child soldiers um, stays firmly put. And with that, will follow dollars, because that will drive how development agencies around the world, uh, if there's a commitment to, for example, eradicating uh, or minimizing child soldiers. Um, some of these questions are going to be uh, inside baseball. Um, so I'm going to. You may have to translate. Maybe. <laughs> um, and it could be simply that. Uh, there are important issues that have been raised and uh, to put on your radar screen. So if you don't have ready answers at, 
today, that's fine. Um, there are things that have been ongoing. Some of, some of them not, some of them you've been deeply involved in. Here's an interesting question, and it gets to this issue of new actors, new possibly positive actors in the, in the field. How does the USG, or J, since you're not necessarily answering for all of the USG, um, view the role of large multinational companies in joining this fight, say in places like Burma slash Myanmar? That's a really great question. I think, you know, part of the, the new frontier for the for tip work is is with private corporations. And there are, are a number of organizations and as you know that have been been pushing the the corporate world in this space. Um, you know, as I think about some of the complementary pieces of the US government engagement with corporations, whether you're thinking about OGP and the extractives industry transparency stuff. Um, there are some logical corollaries between engaging companies in work that is explicitly anti-trafficking and engaging companies in work that is um, anti-corruption mm -hmm. or that is about transparency and governance and accountability. Um, you know, you might be able to make, a, a, you might be able to draw that circle even wider, but corporations have been edging into this space through the labor rights paradigm, mm -hmm. and I think um, I think there's a lot of space to engage more explicitly on the anti-trafficking side, and I would see it as a huge opportunity for private corporations to um, to play a leading role in a cutting-edge issue, and and hope very much that um, you know be great. I hope they're talking about it at Davos, for example. Be Ooh, great, what an great, excellent idea! Great idea. It'd be really interesting to go and look and see whether or not. When Davos is like next Soon. week? Yep. Soon. Um, assuming maybe 21, nobody in this room is going to Davos, but if anybody is going, please do raise the issue. And we know at least uh, Jeannie Bergo at Internews is going. There's a very small number, something like 25 nonprofits who, who are invited. So we better email and tweet our friends uh, and, and raise it. But I think it's a great question. Maybe something to get on the radar screen for next year is Davos needs to have a panel on trafficking and what the private sector can do about this. Um, on another side of the uh, for-profit, in 2012, uh, President Obama announced an executive order on government contracting and human trafficking. Unfortunately, the Federal Acquisition Regulation Clause to hold contractors accountable seems to be languishing. What is the U.S. doing to hold government contractors accountable? Um, I don't know the specifics of that, but I do know that this has been an Obama administration priority. Um, it was an initiative that they undertook and that it is in progress. So my answer, I guess, to those who are interested is stay tuned. I'm hopeful. Um, this is not necessarily something that is, I think, straight up state's angle or Jay's, but I could be wrong, and it's a really important question. What are we, by that I guess we mean the U United States, doing to cut off traffickers' access to the U.S. banking system and their ability to move money across the globe? And I ask this in part because when I served at, USD, at USAID and, and I would go to atrocity prevention board meetings, the Treasury folks always had some of the coolest tools to be able to get their hands on, on money um, very thoughtfully and very carefully. Mm -hmm. What's your, does, first of all, does no, Jay have do any? This. You have we don't. no. It's, so it, this is all treasury. treasury and, and justice, probably. Um, I mean, I do think that having a Jay conversation with Treasury and justice and elevating it might be a very interesting um, thing to have happen. Well, again, if, if this gets back to the holistic approach, you know, if we're increasingly thinking about how do we use sanctions in the context of uh, anti-corruption work? How do we mm. use uh, sanctions in a very targeted and sometimes even below the radar way to send messages and alter behavior? Um, to the extent that we're thinking about that as involving you know, bad actors who are also traffickers, um, then we are, again, mainstreaming the trafficking concerns into some of the traditional measures of foreign policy activism that I think is only to, to the strengthening right. of the anti-trafficking work. Um, this is, in some ways, I think, perhaps going to your previous experience, um, you've had such a unique background with impressive depth on, this, on security issues. How can US military training 
and cooperation better increase the awareness and effectiveness of foreign forces? Um, that's, if I've mangled that question. Um, I think I might slightly rewrite it and say, from the perspective that you've had deep engagement with the US military, in fact, you spent 2012, is that right? As a Minerva Fellow at, the, at the Naval War College. Um, I mean, certainly in, uh -huh. certainly in the work that um, we've done here at CSIS, there is a need for uniformed service members, um, not just in the US, but around the world, to have a greater awareness of TIP, and particularly in this correlation with security issue. What's your advice on how to do that in a way that makes Well, I'm sense? still working on trying to get really tailored civilian casualty training into uh, our, our training for, for foreign forces. And, um, and I think you know, the military, which does uh, such an extraordinary job in training, looks at training uh, in, a, in a very sort of uh, layered and standardized way that they would train. Um, so it is, it is a challenge to, uh, to both help integrate in training, because the answer is always, if you want me to train on that, what do you want me to not train on, right? That's always the answer. What's coming off the table. Um, but then there's also a question of, you know, how do you identify those partners for whom this training is particularly necessary or opposite? You know, the, the DRL has created a new Office for Human Rights and National Security, and they are just beginning to engage with the military. In fact, they were down at SOCOM today. Um, having discussions about, about military training and a host of human rights issues. So that's a nascent conversation that I hope very much I can support as Jay um, because there are a host of ways in which I think our modeling of military professionalism for other uh, armed forces is insufficient without some additional increment that may not be what our military forces require, mm -hmm. but may very much be needed to fill a deficit gap in either the education or awareness of other military forces. I will say that, in, that generally speaking, we would look to the police to provide the, the identification functions and the, the law enforcement functions, not the military. Right. So, um, so be careful what one wishes for, because we do, we do want to have civilian rule of law wherever possible. But there's a, host, there's a host of possibilities for specialized training for foreign militaries that inevitably find themselves in, in either policing roles or in counterinsurgency roles in which these issues are likely to arise for the reasons that we were just talking about. And there, I think, there is real value in, in developing probably more of a mobile train the trainers program mm -hmm. that would do detailed work on you know the tactics of avoiding civilian harm human rights law but applied human rights law not reciting the declaration the UN declaration of human rights and it could include things like trafficking as well and i and i would see that not necessarily as a standard model but as something that could be appended where it was appropriate and i really do think that you ought to have a mobile train the trainers program so that you can equip regional areas to be doing their own training because it's always more effective when it comes from sort of the like-minded, if you will. This is a great question. How do the bureaus within J work together to protect children from exploitation in conflicts and emergencies? I might broaden it out to say, how does J work with other parts of the US government, including uh, AID that has such so many frontline offices working in emergencies? It's, it's a great question because you know one of the things that, that makes me um, unusual at state, I think, is that I don't come from within the bureaucracy, so I don't think about problems through a bureaucratic lens. Mm. I think about problems differently. And so that is constantly a challenge when you work in a bureaucracy that by def, you know, pursuant to Weber, you know, has to sort of organize itself in a way that is not necessarily about the problem, but instead is about its own sort of existence and structure. And so what that question poses is sort of the next layer out, which is, you know, I see it as you know, we've got all these different bureaus and they're interrelated because the problems are interrelated. This is a slice that goes through and says, what about kids? Mm -hmm. So we're still working on the first interrelated <laughs> part and we don't have, you know, the kid thing. We have, you know, a special office to work on, you know, women. We have mm -hmm. the, the, the ambassador at large for global women's issues. That's an example uh, where we have, for whatever reasons, highlighted you know, the, the target audience of the various interventions. 
Um, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have anything like that at state. We may have within DRL a child advocate or someone, who, I, I, I would expect we have people who work on children's rights within DRL. But as a, an operational issue in terms of how do we organize the meetings and how are the papers framed and what are the issues that are, that are being decided by way of policy, that's generally speaking not the way that we do it. So what my answer would be is that when we work on rights issues, um, that is, that is the, sub, the, the subset of rights issues is where children, integration on children happens. Um, but PRM, for example, when it's thinking about, about migration issues or when it's thinking about um, you know, refugees, will in its programming often address children, um, but really thinks about it as a, as a refugee problem or as a migration problem. So here's a question. Um, review of states' compliance with anti-trafficking standards. Where does the United States stand? What are the biggest challenges still facing the United States Rehuman trafficking. Then I ask that in part, fully understanding that your job is not to um, essentially affect how the U.S. inside addresses this issue. But I have found it very helpful when engaging other countries and other governments to have some sense of how we're doing mm -hmm. on this. Um, has this is it a topic that's come up when you've been on travel? You know, it's interesting. Um, most of the focus when traveling is, is in a bilateral exchange, is in um, people trying to understand how the language of the TVPA and, and the, the tip reporting criteria relate or do not relate to their efforts to solve the problem. So most of the discussion that one has on a bilateral level is, you know, look, we're doing this or we're doing this, but you are only looking at whether we're doing that or, I mean, it's much more uh, transactional mm -hmm. at the, in the bilateral way when, when the TIP team is working on TIP issues. It really, it, this, is, this is not an issue on which there's normative dispute or finger pointing. Almost everybody wants to do better. No, no government wants to see its citizens enslaved. It's just, it's not. So that's really not, With the comparative one is or not two exceptions the, that I can think of. Most, I said most. But, right. But the, but, so, so it's not right. a comparative, generally speaking. It's a, it's a, help me understand why you, where the criticism comes from, and let me tell you about how we are trying to address the mm -hmm. problem. And that's what I mean by normative success. It's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. Nobody is, arguing whether or not you know, there ought to be a right to X. That's, that's not mm -hmm. on the table. And that is very much a function of, of the leadership that, that the anti-trafficking movement has shown over the last 15 years. Um, there are a number of questions that have to do with regions, um, which I think are, for somebody who's got a lot of functional bureaus, I'm not sure the best question for you, but I wonder, in your travels and in your own research and, and writing, um, there's certain regions that have more complicated uh, trafficking issues than others. Um, are you finding, are there places where you see particular vibrance in the community to combat trafficking? I mean, you mentioned going to India. That must have been an extraordinary experience meeting uh, a Nobel Prize winner on this issue. Um, is, is, your, is your sense that um, this is done at a kind of international level, or that there, there are champions inside government. I mean, every year, state honors J honors, honors right? Mm -hmm. Is there? How do you feel about that process? Is there a different way to sort of generate who those heroes are? And, and one worries sometimes that the usual suspects get nominated. And you know, are there strategies for pulling in unlikely heroes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't speak to the specifics of the hero selection process, but I can tell you that, and that in most of the places where I've had an opportunity to travel as the undersecretary, I have um, made it a point to visit people who work on trafficking issues. And to me, they're all heroes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm blown away. I, I often ask the embassy, you know, who's, who's not already on your radar, but have you heard about mm -hmm. who is working on whatever? And... Um, and the, the, the number of people for whom, for reasons that, that seem highly personal in many cases, uh -huh. in, in some cases they're, they're faith motivations, in uh -huh. some cases they're born of personal experience, but they're, 
unique reasons that these people have have devoted their lives to some aspect of this problem, and it is it is it is mind blowing. So um, definitely, if you're only choosing ten of the probably tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. who are heroes around the world working uh, to combat trafficking, um, you may get drawn to the usual suspects. But um, I I'm astonished by by the. The, the the cottage industry of of people who are 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 just moved to dedicate their entire lives to this. I think the more important question, frankly, and this relates, this is not in any way to de to denigrate the efforts of individuals, um, because they have taught us about the interventions that work. Um, but I think a really important question is the political will of a of a country, mm -hmm. and um, I think it is fair to say that. Any controversial uh, process that involves uh, rankings and judgments can be perceived in a variety of extremely negative ways. And I think it's fair to say that if you think historically about the emergence of the State Department's Human Rights Report, you would find a similar sort of history where um, initially people, you know, they didn't want to hear the Human Rights Report, right? I mean, it's it's you know, who are you right. to be judging us? And and I I am I am very empathetic with that perspective, nonetheless. The Human Rights Report played a very important role in shaping norms and in changing behaviors. And I think that that arc of how, how institutions and norms develop and how people adjust to that and then internalize that, that is, that is the arc I am confident that the Trafficking in Persons Report will take. And already in the short time that I have been at the State Department, um, you know, the more I'm able to explain, you know, this is a requirement of the law. You may be very trying very hard to do X and Y and Z, and that may have huge impact here, but this is the law, and this is the report that follows the law, and so please understand this, and these are some best practices. But there, as I said, because there's not a normative debate, and because it really is a question of, well, then what works, and then how do we make that happen? Um, I think we're, we're very much in the right trajectory. And so the numbers, back to your point about the numbers, Sarah, you know, it's very difficult to know whether um, enlarged numbers represent an enlarged problem right. or a greater transparency of the problem right. or a different methodology for describing the problem. Um, and there's no question that the problem is huge. But I, 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 am, I am confident that the constellation of people and governments that are committed to making a difference on this issue are moving on the right trajectory. And it's, it's very exciting. And I think there are analogs from the past that can give us great hope, even as we look at these enormous numbers and the scope of the problem and its intractability. So we've come to the end of our hour. We have a lot of people collectively in this room, if you were going to add up all the time that people spent combating trafficking, it would literally be hundreds of years. And um, it's very important that people who have not spent decades working on this problem don't feel that it's too late to engage on this. And so we're thrilled that you came to speak with us. We hope that you'll, you'll bring followers along, that people will be uh, joining, that everybody at Jay is going to say, I know there's a, a, a Jay tip office, but I want to be involved too. I can't imagine a, having an ambassador anywhere in the world that wouldn't want to be part of this. Um, it's such a an exhilarating, I just have to have a little bit of that feel of, of what, it, what it means. So please join me in thanking Undersecretary Sewell for, for coming to be with us. And take a moment and congratulate yourselves for the work that you have done. Um, we have some of the authors of the original Trafficking Victims Protection Act, uh, Dorothy Taft. Um, 15 years, it's a blink of an eye, but uh, you're right, the normative change is, is, is real and uh, impressive. So thank you very much.